Bibles, please turn to Mark chapter 14. Mark 14. We would do well to remember that the supper that was instituted earlier this night in Mark 14 wasn't just the institution of the Lord's Supper. It was the reorientation of Israel's Passover to foreshadow the death of Jesus. He is the lamb that would be sacrificed for ultimate judgment. The destroyer is not only going to pass through Egypt, he is going to pass through the entire world. This is the only lamb whose blood will preserve one from that coming judgment. This morning we enter the Garden of Gethsemane in the text with Jesus and his disciples. This is where the literal physical suffering of Jesus will begin. The passage emphasizes the fact that the disciples fail to do what Jesus had asked them to do. In his apocalyptic discourse earlier in chapter 13, they do not keep watch, which is precisely what he told them to do. And when his arrest comes, they desert him, all of them. Later, Peter will also fulfill what Jesus said of him when early in the morning he denies three times that he knows Jesus, even though he is the only disciple, by the way, initially that goes with Jesus or follows Jesus back into Jerusalem. Jesus didn't predict the falling away of his disciples earlier in chapter 14 to judge them or to judge them for their failure, nor is he inviting us to do that, but to underline just how momentous and serious is the hour of Jesus' suffering. Nobody can withstand this hour, not even the great Peter, who really of all of them had the greatest will, the strongest commitment to follow with Jesus, but the desertion of the disciples at the hour Jesus needs them most shows us all that truly no one can withstand the great hour of suffering that is dawning, the suffering that is required for our salvation. Nobody can fully understand this. Nobody that is except one man, Jesus Christ, the one man who is destined to die as a result of all of it, as the suffering servant of the Lord, just before he comes as the exalted son of man to the ancient of days to receive his kingdom upon his ascension. Nowhere is the unfaithfulness, the misunderstanding of the disciples, which Mark has featured all the way through, nowhere is it more clear than on this night. This is how bad it is. This is where their hearts really were at that time. But against the backdrop of their failure, There is also nothing more clear than the faithfulness of Jesus for them and for us. When the fate of humanity was literally in the balance, Jesus Christ won the victory that bought our salvation through God's judgment on him, not us. Let's pray and then we'll look at the passage. Father, I ask for your grace this morning to preach your word. I ask you, Father, to be filled with your Holy Spirit for this task so that what comes from me is not my ideas but your truth. And Father, I ask that you would open the heart of every person who is here that has come to hear and to receive your word, your eternal truth, which is able to save our souls. We ask and pray for these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We'll begin in verse 32 this morning of Mark 14. And they went to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. And he took with him Peter and James and John and began to be greatly distressed and troubled. And he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death, remain here and watch. And going a little farther, he fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. And he came and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not watch one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And again, he went away and prayed, saying the same words, And again, he came and found them sleeping for their eyes were very heavy and they did not know what to answer him. And he came the third time and said to them, are you still sleeping and taking your rest? It is enough. The hour has come. The son of man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer 
is at hand. The focus here, again, falls on the fact, what's highlighted in the passage is that the disciples fail to do precisely what Jesus had called them to do in the Olivet Discourse earlier in 1333 and 37. They do not keep watch. As predicted in verse 27 of Mark 14, later down in verse 50, they all left him and fled. But we can't judge them, beloved, because as we look at this passage, even Jesus is feeling the strain and the pressure of this moment. In verses 33 and 34, knowing that his time is now at hand, he takes Peter, James, and John to watch while he prays, and he began to be greatly distressed and troubled. He even says, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch. He's so filled with sorrow, he literally feels like he is going to die as a result of it. He, his grief consumes him. In verse 35, it literally knocks him to the ground, and from there he prays that if it were possible, which by the way, it isn't, the hour might pass from him. Now, beloved, listen. Let everybody in this room understand from the pulpit to the pew to the balcony, this grief is because of you and me. Are you trying to win us to Jesus by making us feel guilty? No, no, no. We are guilty, whether we feel it or not. I'm reminding us all this morning, even the Christians, that this is what our salvation costs. He felt so much sorrow, he thought he was going to die. His grief took him to his knees. That's because we are sinners, what we're reading here. Because as Isaiah the prophet wrote of him, the chastisement, the punishment that brought us peace was laid upon him. For our peace in this hour, Jesus had none. Isn't Jesus God in human flesh? Wasn't this plan God's sovereign design in Scripture that must be fulfilled, which is why Jesus is going through it? Didn't he know this was going to happen? Why is he asking the Father to make the hour of the Son of Man's suffering pass from him? If he knew this is what was going to happen, there's a mystery here. I'm not ashamed to tell you that from the divine perspective, I don't know how to answer that precisely. I'm really only qualified, if qualified is the right word, to speak about the human side of Jesus. That's all I can relate to, and I can't even really relate to his human nature. But this hour has been coming since before the creation of the world, literally, and now it's here. It's literally that moment. The divine nature of Jesus never stops being divine. No question, he never ceases to be God, but his human nature now never ceases to be human either. In the human nature of Jesus, all there is in this moment is sorrow and grief, and he is begging. The one who made everything, sustains everything by the word of his power, is begging the Father in this moment. Dads, let me talk to you for a minute, okay? Those of you who are fathers, if you have a child, imagine them begging you to keep them from dying a death they don't deserve to die. Imagine them begging you through tears and through grief so strong you can see it's about to kill them to make it, please make it, so that they don't have to die a horrible and cruel and painful death at the hands of people that hate them. And they're dying that death for the people that hate them. Could you deny their request in that moment? What father could do that? I, I couldn't. I couldn't do it. There's no way I could let my child die, in particular for people who hate him or hate her, right? Have you ever felt that horrible feeling in your stomach when you're, you find out your kid's being made fun of by other kids? or they're being teased, or they're being bullied. If you're a parent, you know if that's happened to your child, you know how that makes you feel. You know the emotion it brings up in you, the helplessness that you feel, the anger that you feel. It's awful. There's, there's, my point is there's no way I could stick to this plan here. I mean, I, I, I would want to, given what's at stake here, but the text is actually gonna tell us, don't, you and I aren't meant to go noble out of this text. We're not meant to leave it believing in ourselves. He actually even says it. So praise God 
that this conversation for the salvation of humanity is taking place between God the Father and God the Son, that this is between them, that only the two of them can truly understand what's happening here. Thank God it's not us here, bargaining, pleading. Verse 36, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Just ponder that, because it's true. All things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me. Yet, not what I will, but what you will. Again, think about this for a minute. This is mind-blowing to me. All things are possible for God to do. Amen? Oh. Amen. Amen. Right. Amen. Luke and Matthew's Gospels, however, reveal to us that the opposite is also true. Nothing is impossible for God. So when Jesus is praying, all things are possible for God. Nothing is impossible for God to do. Do you know what that means? It could have gone another way. It could have gone another way. And salvation would still be accomplished if all things are possible for him and nothing is impossible for him. So why not? Beloved, this is the way God chose. See, we tend to heap our views of justice onto God to determine whether or not God is just. Although at the cross, God had to do something to satisfy justice because justice is hanging out there demanding to be met. No, where does justice come from? Who created it? Who decides what is just? Who decides what is necessary? Who decreed and ordained that it would be this way and not another? In God's refusal to let this cup pass from Jesus, you and I are being reminded, beloved, in the strongest way possible, that God simply will not go back on his word. He will not break his promises even when the life of Jesus is finally on the line. He won't back off of his word or his will. We often think, again, God was bound to orchestrate the crucifixion because it was the only way that he could forgive sinners and remain just and righteous. But again, says who? God. That's why it goes this way. He isn't bound to our definitions of justice, beloved. God is bound only forever to himself. It's his decision that it not go another way. And here in this moment... The humanity of Jesus knows it could go another way, and he's up against it now. This is the hour. This is the frailness of his humanity. Is there another way? But I, I, if there is, and this way is your will, I will do it. I will do it. It was possible for there to be another way. Of course there was, but God would not use another way. This was the way. Why? Well, yes, beloved, there is absolutely the fact that without the shedding of Jesus' blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Yes, that's one reason it can't go another way. But it's also true that in addition to ensuring the glory of his grace forever through the death and resurrection of Jesus, remember that God also wanted to demonstrate his love for us in the cross where his son was forsaken. This is the way, then, that God would fully accomplish his purpose. This is the way God designed would show his love, would demonstrate his love for us. This is what I designed and am willing to go through with because I love you and desire to save you. If you deny God's love for you, Understand in the call to salvation, that's what you're denying. You're denying that he loves you. You're telling him, no, thank you. And there is no other way to be saved than but God's love for you. So Jesus prays, yet not what I will, but what you will. It's, it's, again, it's not that the will of the Son and the will of the Father are at odds. No, no, no. It's that Jesus Jesus was this committed to doing his Father's will. 
That, again, it's, it's not that Jesus doesn't want to do it and the Father wants him to do it and Jesus is begging. Jesus is this committed to his Father's will. If we can do this another way, let's do it because it's going to get done. But if this is the only way, if it's truly the only way, I will do it. I will do it. Do we see Jesus is what we can only be sometimes? Every once in a while, we will stick to our guns and obey. Every once in a while. Maybe a lot. Maybe some more than others, of course. But he does what we could never do. Never once does he sin. Never once does he fail in his commitment to his Father. Not one time. This should be us begging with God for it not to go this way. And instead, we're more like Peter and James and John in this passage. We'll deny him three times before the sun rises if it will keep us safe, right? We can't stay awake for this fight. Our eyes are too heavy. We're, Abba, Father. Abba doesn't translate Daddy. It's not how it translates, but it does express the same sentiment we would use towards a father when we use that word. But often in the Gospels, we see Jesus go out, to, uh, go out alone to pray, but we don't usually get to hear those prayers when he's out praying to the Father. We get to hear him call. This is a peek into their relationship. We get to hear him call God, Abba, Father, in term of endearment to a father. It's a sad thing for a mom and dad when your kids stop calling you mommy and daddy. Right? I'm lucky to get dad nowadays out of my girls. I get bro a lot. Don't enjoy that at all. But Carmine, my, my 10-year-old son, still out force of habit, calls my wife mama. And she doesn't have the heart to tell him to stop. Right? I'm the dad. I want him to, you know, we got to stop saying mama. But it's a sad time when they stop referring to you in those terms. But, beloved, this is our role in salvation. This is what you and I bring to it, that the sin that makes the cross necessary. That's the role we play in this. So you can mock Jesus. You can call him a liar. You can call him a fraud. You can say he's judgmental or whatever else you want to do, but you can't deny the depth of his heart in this. You can't deny his commitment to this design. If you can do this another way, then do it. But if you decide this is the way, I'll go. So forget the theological difficulties here in understanding the union of humanity and divinity in Jesus. This is real. This is a real conversation. Jesus literally feels this level of grief and anxiety, and it's about to kill him before he even gets to the cross. That's how bad this hour of suffering is. We pass right over these events or tend to so quickly because it almost, we, we hear it so much, it becomes robotic in our minds. We memorize the details of the story. And so we read and you see like, yes, this happened. But listen, yes, this happened. This conversation happened. This grief happened. The other gospels talk about Jesus sweating blood here. That's a literal medical condition. Jesus knows, as his words allude to those of Psalm 42 here, that his death is going to mean some kind of disruption between him and the Father. That's, I think, what weighed most heavily on him in this. But it is the consequence, again, of our sinfulness. He realizes that this is the great time of trial he spoke of, or, or you see him making those connections here in verse 38 from earlier in chapter 13. That this is the hour. And he urges his disciples to watch and pray so that they don't give in to it either. But what are they doing in verse 37? They're sleeping. In other words, what is highlighted here? They can't obey for one hour. Not one. Jesus has been obeying for over 30 years of humanity. Through what he suffered, according to the author of Hebrews, mainly that's right here. He's at one end of the garden, struggling against the great cataclysmic battle that is about to be fought. That's one end. Jesus at the other end, with all the rest of humanity, 
the disciples are struggling just to stay awake. They're just too tired. When the time came to accomplish salvation, we fell asleep and then we bolted. Jesus did all of it. There's a lesson in this, beloved. This is a testimony to the weakness of human mortality. They're not just sinners. They're also just human. It's late. It, it's, you're getting towards early morning. They literally can't keep their eyes open. So listen, even if all we had ever done was just be human, we still wouldn't have obeyed God. We still wouldn't have been able to do what is required. It was always going to come down to this. And listen, our spirits may be willing and desirous to do the will of God. And to commit to him just like Peter. But the fact of the matter is, is that no matter how willing our spirit is, our flesh is weak. You might have every intention of being perfectly obedient and holy as we should as believers. The problem is that the flesh in which we still live is too weak to do it enough. We are too weak to do what God requires. Beloved, beloved, this means that Jesus is going to face this great battle and this great hour of suffering completely alone. Completely alone. He is the only one that will accomplish salvation. He alone can embrace this hour. We can't even watch and pray. What makes us think we could actually scratch the surface of doing all that honors God and that God Requires. This is an example of it. The command here is just stay awake and keep your eyes open. We can't even obey this. What makes us think we could have no other gods before him? What makes us think we'll never commit adultery with our eyes? What makes us think we'll never commit murder with the hatred in our heart? What makes us think we'll always be able to forgive as he's forgiven us? What makes us think we'll be able to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength and love our neighbors as ourselves if for one hour it was needed for us to stay awake and watch with Him and we can't even do it? Not just because we're sinful, but because we're human. None of them wanted to sleep on Jesus. They just couldn't stay awake. You realize what Jesus is dying for? Not just our sinfulness, our humanness. He's not going to give in. The task Jesus must complete is to drink the cup of God's wrath. That's what's happening here. The, the wrath that should be poured down our throats. Jesus will take it all into himself and bear its punishment in full. His death will be for the many. Remember verse 24. His death will be an exclusive place-taking death. As Peter Bolt says in his commentary on Mark, Jesus is dying as a substitute, a substitute he does not deserve to die. He has not sinned even once to merit the penalty for the wages of sin, which is death. And he's doing it in place of those who do deserve to die and have sinned countless times countless times. So the wrath they deserved to be poured out on them will instead be poured out in full on the literal person of Jesus. All those descriptions you get in scripture of God's wrath, that's what was poured out on Christ. That's what sin deserves according to God. And in this moment, all of it is being dumped onto Jesus, is being poured into a cup that he must drink. He will stand in front of every sinner who believes, wrap his arms around them, and take the arrow of God's wrath in his own back for every single one of them. He will go where many will never go, into full damnation and condemnation because he went there for them. The destiny of the many, then, that Jesus is about to die for is precisely what is hanging in the balance here. Will he make it through this? Because here it doesn't look good, right? Again, we know the story, but in the moment, what if he doesn't go? What if he just can't stand up under it? He's human too. So what if he just can't make it out of the garden? 
Will he suffer the wrath of God so that the kingdom of God will come? That puts an end forever to all the suffering and pain and evil of this world. Again, not if he doesn't make it out of the garden. During his discourse back in 13, verse 13, verses 35 to 37, Jesus stressed the necessity of enduring through suffering to the end in this hour of tribulation and the urgent need for his disciples to stay awake watching for the coming of the Son of Man. And now his cosmic struggle takes place, just as he said, at the midnight hour. That's what we're seeing in verse 38, that this is that hour of suffering of which he was speaking. The future of the world, the future of the human race is wrapped up in this exchange between God the Father and God the Son. It's all on the line right here. Everything. Everything. Through the death of Jesus, God will accomplish the impossible. Human beings, sinners, will be reconciled to God and gathered into his kingdom as beloved children and beloved citizens forever. For this reason, for that to take place, Jesus will have to drink this cup. There will be no other way. God's justice, not the principle of justice, is what requires this. Jesus has spoken of his death being a cup previously in chapter 10, verse 38, but now the hour has come for him to drink this cup down to the dregs. He is the faithful servant that God's eyes have been running to and fro throughout the earth to find. He's the faithful one, the obedient one. And he already knows the outcome of the prayer when he says in verse 36, yet not what I will, but what you will. This is the place in prayer where only the Son of Man goes and means it. Jesus wants this cup to be removed, but not as much as he wants what God wants. Who can be that faithful all the time in everything? Not until we're praying in the shadow of death do we know whether or not we can pray this. Because I, I listen, I'm just being honest. I can't imagine that if I was watching my wife on a hospital bed or one of my kids, that I could mean it when I said it because I don't want his will to be that they would die, right? I, I, I don't. I don't want that to be God's will. I want it to be God's will that my family and I have a wonderful life together for a hundred more years. We all are on vacation together. They've got their spouses and all the grandkids and great grandkids are there and we just all go to sleep one night and we don't wake up. That would be great. That'd be wonderful. And I'm, not, I'm not even being facetious. I wish so much that's what could happen. So when he's praying this, when, when you're praying, yet, even if it is your will that I die, even if it is your will that I die, not what I want, but what you want, could, could we just be that loyal and consistent? Could we believe that deeply in the goodness of God that we would just let it all go? And not just once, all the time. We would never falter, never fail. Jesus isn't sinning here. So this, this anxiety, this sorrow isn't sinful. It's divine. He won't give in. No matter what I must endure, I want what you will more than what I will. And beloved, listen. That's the kind of person we should all be. That's what we were created to be, and none of us can do it. What happened in the Garden of Eden when humanity fell? What were Adam and Eve saying? Not your will. My will be done. That fruit looks good to me. That fruit will make me wise. I want it. I know you said I can't have it, but I want it. What happens in another garden with a second Adam for a new humanity when he is tempted way beyond what any regular human being could bear? Not my will, but your will. And now, through the forsaking of his only begotten son, the many will be embraced by God. Because just as all through his entire ministry, from his baptism in the Jordan River, until this prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane, the Son consents to do His Father's will. 
They are in this together. The father commands, the son obeys because it's his delight. Remember, that's what Jesus wanted most. That was his delight, the Lord and his will. So even if it went against his nature, he knew his delight was in the law of the Lord. His delight was to do his father's will. More than his delight was to get what he wanted. None of us are like this. None of us. But now what was impossible for us will be guaranteed for us by the virtue of Christ alone. But not if he didn't want what God wanted more than what he wanted. And in this he never wavered, beloved. He is our Savior, but not without his suffering. At his most lonely and desperate hour of need, his prayer comes to an end, and he has to wake up his sleeping disciples for the third time. You, you see what's happening here? You could even have the Spirit prodding you. Stay awake, stay awake, stay awake. I would, I want to, but I just, I can't keep my eyes open. You've all been there. Preachers are well aware of how hard it is to keep your eyes open. You just see people pulling the... And once it starts, it's not going to stop, Right? Once that starts, you know it's, it's I'm going to look like an idiot for the next however much longer this clown is going to talk, right? It's just, just going to keep happening. Or when you're driving and that starts, it's horrible. That, that's not even sin, beloved. That's human. You know, there, there, if maybe you worked all night. Maybe you had a long week and you just come in here and you're just tired. You're not sinning. You can't keep your eyes open, right? We need to, we don't just need Jesus obeying a few things for us, like, like covering the principle in general. We need him doing everything that we can't do and covering everything we have done. That's what's happening here. That's this sorrow in his heart, what he has to do, what it will cost. Let us be going, he says in verse 42, my betrayer is at hand. When you get angry at Jesus because maybe somebody has hurt you and he forgives sins for free, right? Understand for free to you and I. The forgiveness of our sins didn't come cheap, right? It, it's, God is not simply blowing over what somebody has done to you and saying, no, just forget about it, you got to get over it. Don't you love how we tell people that? Well, you got to get past it. You don't just have to forgive, you have to forget. Good luck. Good luck. When you get angry at him because he forgives sins, even the sins of those who have hurt you, and you feel like there isn't going to be any justice, listen, I don't have the ability with words to comfort you in that. Some hurts are too deep. They're just too deep. What I would say, if you came to me with that, or if I can say it to all of you, go sit in the garden for a while with Jesus. Just go there and stay in this text for a while and pray through it. Just pray through it. Read it and pray. Read it and pray. All the cries of heaven and earth for justice were answered this night, all of them. In his suffering, all suffering is hidden. It's taken in. It's dealt with for his people. All of it is felt, right? We've talked about that before, I think, but as a Christian, you're like, if I forgive that person and they're a, they're, and they're a Christian, then what they did to me just go, no, 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 it, it was punished. They were punished. It just, they weren't. Jesus was for what they did. We have to believe the truth of the gospel just in, not, in learning how to not hate people that have hurt us. Because he took it on himself. It's been paid for, right? That's why he would say, don't, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Why? Well, because if Jesus is covering your sin, that vengeance has been taken. It was poured out on Jesus. He drank that cup. But if they didn't, if there is no covering for their sin, if the blood of Jesus isn't on the door of their heart, they will be repaid. They will pay for it for eternity. So in Christ, all of this is reconciled. All of it, all suffering. All injustice as we see it is reconciled. 
in the death of the innocent for the guilty by the will of God. In his suffering, all suffering, he said, all of it is felt, all of it. We should be drinking this cup. We, we all should be drinking this cup. You, you can't talk to Jesus about unfair. You, we, we just can't. This is for us, for what we did. And we won't taste it because he did. God could, God could say, God could say, oh, you, you get to go free because my son suffered. That's nice. And yet he doesn't say that. If anybody could claim unfair, it's God. If anything doesn't make sense in the Bible, it's heaven, not hell. We love justice. We want justice. Hell is justice. Heaven is grace. Nobody deserves to go there. So if we're going to question God's character on fairness, it better be how in the world can you forgive sinners on the back of your son? If there's an injustice, it's that. Guilty people being guilty is not injustice, beloved. And God never says that to us because Jesus said to God, not my will, but your will be done. All is reconciled in Jesus. We, we must accept this as sufficient for justice or our bitterness will consume us. Verse 43, And immediately, while he was still speaking, Judas came, one of the twelve, and with him a crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests and scribes and the elders. Now the betrayer had given them a sign, saying, This, the one I will kiss, is the man sees him and lead him away under guard. And when he came, he went up to him at once and said, Rabbi, and he kissed him. And they laid hands on him and seized him. But one of those who stood by drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. And Jesus said to them, this is a great moment. Have you come out against a robber with swords and clubs to capture me? Day after day, I was with you in the temple teaching and you did not seize me, but let the scriptures be fulfilled. And they all left him and fled. Jesus now knows the hour has come because Judas has arrived. That's his signal. Okay, it's here. This is it. He knew it was close. Now he knows it's arrived. And he comes with a crowd, or, or Judas comes with a crowd decked out in the symbols of our violent world, of how we get justice, swords and clubs, against the accused, whether they're guilty or not. They're out to get a revolutionary. That's how they're acting. And this is Judas Iscariot. This is one of the 12. Think about this. Just a few hours earlier, Jesus had served this man bread and wine. Judas took the first Lord's Supper. And to make it as horrible as it could be, the sign he concocted so that they know which one to arrest is the kiss of friendship from Judas. The one that I woke up to and kiss and call rabbi, it's him. Arrest him. For three and a half years, they had walked side by side. Jesus knew this man was taking money from what they collected to help support what they were doing. And the Savior was offered up for 30 pieces of silver. Depending on which silver coins they were, it was somewhere between $91 and $441. That's what the life of Jesus is worth to us. I could, I could clear two, three hundred bucks on this. This is the first step in handing Jesus over to sinners as he predicted. First, Judas hands him to the high priest. The high priest will hand him to the Gentiles. All humanity is here. Jew and Gentile represented in this betrayal. This is the hour when the world will destroy the Messiah of Israel. This is, make no mistake, this is the abomination of desolation. This is the desecrating sacrilege, more sacrilegious than any other act in history. This is the true temple being desecrated. Right? This is the true temple being desecrated. This is the great tribulation beyond all others, the suffering and the murder of the Son of Man. What human being has experienced what Jesus did in this chapter and is about to. Isaiah would say, none. The precise hour no one knew about except the Father. In 1332, it's come. But here at midnight, there's still no coming of the Son of Man that was also 
promised as a part of this no coming of the kingdom of God. And we'll move in to his early morning trial. If we're listening to the text, still expecting that maybe it's now, maybe it's now and he'll be delivered. And in the most horrible irony known to humanity, Jesus will be condemned for blasphemy. That's how much we know about God. When God shows up and says, I am, we say, you're a blasphemer and we kill him. But when he's condemned, the promise will ring true again. Because just before they throw him to the wolves, they ask him again, are you saying that you're the Christ? Answer us. He'll testify later in verse 62, I am. And you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. And Daniel's prophecy will be fulfilled. He will be crucified, raised from the dead, and exalted into heaven. But first the betrayer says, Rabbi! And kisses him. These men lay hands on him and seize him. Luke tells us it was Peter who cut off the ear of Malchus, by the way. One of the servants of the high priest, Peter, tried. Listen, he really tried. He did. He's, he's, he's valiant here. But I want to close with, with this. As valiant as it is for Peter to do this, do we see the parallel here? between Jesus and humanity. As valiant as it is for Peter to try and stop this, whether or not it can be stopped has been resolved. It is now the will of God for this to happen. Peter is disobeying God, rejecting God's will and saying, no, 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 I don't want him to be killed. I will not allow it. Jesus prays, not my will, but your will. What does Peter do? Not your will, but my will. We are so corrupted. That's how we sin when we're trying to defend Jesus. God's law and God's will and holiness are so far out of our range of perception, we can't even defend Jesus without denying the will of God. It's outright disobedience. It's, it's a denial of God's will. It's now evident then. And if they would have been awake, they might have heard it. That this is the Father's will for this to occur. In defending Jesus, Peter is defying God. And he's unknowingly, you might want to cheer for him here. Don't cheer for him here. Because if he succeeds, we die. He's unknowingly unwantingly interrupting God's plan of redemption, standing in the way of all of us and our need of him to suffer. Because it can make us weep, but we need it. No games. We want this to be the will of God or we're not going to be saved. We have no idea how far we are from God, how deeply we need reconciled to him. We're every time the father looks at us, what is he going to see? The people that got his son killed? Or is he going to see his own children? Well, that depends on what happens to the son. He's standing in the way of all of us in our need of Jesus to suffer. This is the proof that in Peter's heart, again, not what you will, but what I will. So Peter didn't care in that moment what Jesus had said. He didn't care what the will of God was. It, or he, he foreshadowed it earlier when Jesus went to wash his feet. You're not going to wash me. If I don't wash you, you have no part with me. You're not going to die. If I don't die for you, you have no part in me. And hide signs 2020, absolutely. But at this moment, he must not have really believed yet how desperately he himself needed the death of Jesus or he wouldn't have gotten in the way. He would have bowed his head and said, forgive me that this is what's required but please do it and save my soul. We want to defend Jesus too, but if we do, we lose our souls because this is what it's going to cost. Our duty, like Peter's, is to put our hands down and let God have his way. We cannot accomplish this. We cannot accomplish this. Every time we try to do it ourselves when God has been clear. We are cutting off Malchus's ear. We are kissing his cheek, even with the best intentions. Jesus doesn't need our input or our contribution. If we try to take part in salvation, we'll mess it up. 
And that, that's what you have, by the way, in 51 and 52. And a young man followed him with nothing but a linen cloth about his body, and they seized him, but he left the linen cloth and ran away naked. What, what is the text saying? We don't know who this is. The, the best speculation narrows it down to two. It's either an unknown follower of Jesus who would have been very wealthy because only the wealthy wore linen cloths under their clothes, or it may have been Mark, the author of the gospel himself. We don't know. The point is not their identity. The point here is look at the chaos of this night. This is the hour of suffering. This is the hour of trouble. You have uh, swords and clubs. You have yelling and screaming. You have a guy getting his ear cut off. You have the Son of Man being led away to be crucified. You have, you have a guy running around naked. I mean, it's, it's just absolute chaos. This is the darkest hour of humanity. And Jesus knew this was coming. He knew he was going to die. But let the Scriptures be fulfilled. Jesus will go to the cross. Jesus meant what he said in the garden. So, beloved... The jig is up, all right? The jig is up. He knows this about us, that we are too weak and too sinful, and he knew it that night. Remember, it was after he was betrayed that he gave himself up for arrest. You would think, when he was at his weakest and most vulnerable, that Judas showing up with a brute squad and kissing him on the cheek would have been the straw that broke the camel's back. All right, I can't do this anymore. But no, beloved, he went willingly for those who were guilty, and Jesus didn't get fooled. Look at 48. And 49. He's not fooled. He's not fooled. He gave himself up. And it was while he was stretched out and suspended on a gnarled piece of wood by nails that he said, Father, forgive them. They, they don't know what they're doing. We need Jesus for our sin, for our humanity. Nothing and no one else can do it. And if he didn't, our souls would be lost even if we have very willing spirits. Our spirits are not powerful enough to cause our flesh to do what God requires. We need Jesus because the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Jesus knows we mean well often. It's not enough. We need somebody going all the way. We need one whose spirit is not only willing, but whose flesh is strong enough to obey. And only Jesus is that one. That's the lunacy of them falling asleep on him three times that we need to understand. That's how frail we actually are. When the fate of humanity was in the balance, Jesus Christ won the victory that bought our salvation through God's judgment on him. Praise his name. Thy will be done, not mine. Please let that be so, God. Come to Jesus. If you know you need him, come to him.